perfectly, hey? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, perfect. So let me start so long. So the topic today was patellar femoral joint, but I think that's um, narrowed down to the patellar femoral instability, otherwise it gets too much and too big. And I want to get enough detail across. So what, what we decided on is we're going to focus on, on the instability. I'm going to give you a, a simple basic assess, basic of, of the patellar femoral joint and, and how to assess it in terms of the instability. Then Johan is going to speak about different surgical options um, to address instability. And that's basically um, the, the, key, the key term is always a la carte surgery. Um, so it's, it's sometimes very difficult to, to really understand what needs to be done, but it's nice to understand the menu. So he's going to show us the menu and then later on we can discuss in the group um, when to use what procedure. And then I, I hope that Dave North and, and Richard can also just um, join the discussion because it's nice to draw on the experience. Um, then Richard is going to speak specifically on the MPFL reconstruction, which is the workhorse of, of treating patellar femoral instability. And it's really a procedure that um, it, it, I think we need to know also for the exam, but mainly for day-to-day for -day, um, knee surgery. And then Dave is going to speak about uh, trochleoplasty. He's He's bringing a lot of experience through a fellowship that he's done mainly on or with a special emphasis on the patellar femoral joint. So he's, he's speaking with a lot of surgical experience. It's nice to listen to someone that has done some of these procedures. Um, so I'll start so long and I'll uh, talk to you about, um, I'll talk to you about assessing patellar femoral joint instability and it's really part science and part art. Science being stuff that you can measure and art is something that you can really only see in terms of movement, but it's not often easy to really um, measure movement. So um, when you look at the bar mechanics in terms of stability, you, you basically um, have statistic, uh, stat, um, static um, constraints and dynamic constraints. The static being ligaments, the trochlea, which is basically the, the track for the, for the patella and the alignment of the limb. And dynamic being mainly muscles around the knee and especially the uh, vastus medialis. You can see how these forces kind of act on the knee. Most of them are pulling, trying to pull the knee medial. So the uh, vastus medialis and the me uh, medial retinacular fibers as well as the MPFL trying to keep the patella medial and some of the forces are trying to force the patella out lateral, um, some of which are also the quadriceps or the extensor mechanism that has through the slight valgus of the knee has got a, a, a bowstringing force on the patella. When you look at the patella, the anatomy of the patella, you can see that the, um, the axis is actually not perpendicular. And um, the axis of the patella femoral joint is not perpendicular to the axis of the leg. Um, also, the lateral femoral is higher than the median femoral that prevents the patella from, from sub subluxing out. And you can see the sulcus lines are basically the, um, the borders of the trochlea, and, and that's where the trochlea ends and where the condyles start. When you look at the medial side, you can either look at the medial structures as an anatomist, which you can see on the left, that's basically as Smigelski did an inside-out dissection, and it, he just purely looks at it from an anatomic standpoint, and he, he describes it, the media structures as a very thin uh, band, and within that band are some fascial or some, some thickenings um, that he describes as um, connections from the femur to the quadriceps tendon, which you can see here in, in green, from the femur to the VMO, which you can see in blue, and from the tibia to the lower pole of the, of the medial border of the patella. Now on the right, you can see uh, a dissection that Laprat did, and he dissected from outside in, like we do as, as surgeons. And he also basically dissected things out that you can reconstruct. So it's easier for us to kind of understand it because we can kind of, reconstructors and anatomic structures, the MPFL, 
the MPML, so it's a, it, it's, it's a connection from the patella to the medial meniscus, and the MT, MPTL, which is a connection from the patella to the tibial, um, medial tibial border of the um, medial tibial um, area, and then the patella tendon. So you can see that those three ligaments are the main ligaments that one can reconstruct, and um, which also basically help with medial stability. The joint reaction forces, and that's important, especially for pain and some, some of the procedures you can do with um, distally to realign the patella, you need to take in a, in a, into account the joint reaction forces and how they change within the knee during the range. So you can see uh, with, this, with these um, biomechanical, um, these, these are very um, 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 simple biomechanical drawings of the forces, the joint reaction forces in extension and inflection. Taking note that in flexion, the quadriceps muscle actually also loses its, advan its, its advantage. So it can't pull as hard in flexion, but the joint reaction force is higher in, in flexion. When we look at the contact area, you can see that um, on the femur or on the trochlea, in flexion, it obviously moves distal. And in deep flexion, it, it basically just touches the sides of the distal condyles. Whereas on the patella, um, it moves from distal to proximal. So the further you flex the knee, the more proximal the contact area is. And that's important when we try to dis you know, think about distalizing or medializing um, the, the, the tibial attachment uh, of, the, of the patella tendon in cases where there is defects in the patella. So we need to be cognizant of the fact that we actually also moving the patella in the flexion when, when we're moving the distal tibia. Now, looking at the stabilizers and what, what, which, which um, of, of the components of the medial stabilizers are important, is clearly, um, you can clearly see that MPFL is important, but also that the MTFL and, M, and the MPML are, are actually um, Form, for, can form a, a large part of the medial stabilizing forces. The MPTL, so the tibial connection to the patella is mainly, is, is the main, or is, is, it comes into play when the patella um, tries to dislocate, is dislocating in flexion. So it keeps the patella in flexion and also it keeps the patella from rotating. The MPFL is tightest between zero and 15 degrees. So you can see here, this is an intact MPFL. And when you cut it, then the retaining forces become a lot less in the early in the early flexion angles. So it means that the MPFL has its most important function within the first 20 to 30 degrees of flexion. After that, the trochlea, if it's well formed, should be able to take over the, the stabilization of the of the um, patella. So it basic the MPFL basically is a check rein to guide the patella into the trochlea in, in the first 15 to 30 degrees of flexion. Now, what is patella instability? And this is a consensus statement um, that was kind of worked out to say that the lateral instability of the patella means that the patella escapes in the early flexion. And it's called obligatory dislocation when the patella escapes in deeper flexion, so beyond 45 degrees. That, that's basically what we would call obligatory dislocation. Medial instability is mainly caused by iatrogenic um, problems, or um, things that surgeons do, especially lateral releases. And multi-instability, multi multi-direction instability can be lateral or medial, and that's mainly associated with, with um, and increased um, laxity, patholaxity. There's a pediatric classification. We're not going to go into the details of pediatric patellar dislocations, but um, you can see that there is syndromic um, types, obligatory types. This obligatory type is very much the same as, as in this consensus statement. And then fixed lateral dislocation. It means the patella stays lateral in flexion and extension apart from traumatic, which basically is the same as, as this lateral instability. 
So let's go to assessing someone that comes to you with patellar instability. The main questions that you need to ask in your history is you need to understand what the initial injury was. Was it high energy or low energy? Was there reduction needed? And is there anything um, that could point towards a family history of patellar instability or a systemic or syndromic problem? If it, does if it is a recurrent uh, instability, then it's nice to understand at what time the first episode was, at what age the first episode was, and how many times the patient has dislocated since, what the mechanisms were, especially if the patient has pain and where the pain is. And obviously what expectation the patient has. Um, in terms of the examination, it's nice to kind of structure it in terms of looking at the patient, looking at the limb, and then looking at the knee itself and within the knee, the soft tissue and the patella um, trochlea and the motion, but not all of it can be done through a clinical exam. So you need to have some, some, some um, um, investigations to complete your assessment. Hyperlaxity, most of you understand, you can, you can test with um, Biden's criteria. Um, and patholaxity is basically either too tight or too loose. And especially when the patella dislocates lateral, oftentimes the lateral structures are too tight and the medial structures are too loose. It's nice to let the patient walk, squat, and do a single leg sta stance, or st stance um, to be able to really understand what the, what the alignment of the leg is and how the patella moves. To understand the axial alignment, we there are certain um, ways to to basically assess the patient. Um, it's it's good to put the patient prone to understand what the um, uh, what the uh, femoral neck antiversion is and what the range of internal and external rotation of the hips are, and to assess the foot thigh angle to understand what the tibial torsion is. And I like these pictures here because in the middle of the screen, because that really, um, these pulleys really make it very, uh, illustrate very nicely what or how alignment can influence patella stability. So if you look at misalignment in an, ax in an axial plane or, or vertical angle, um, it looks like this, this picture. When you look at a coronal alignment or misalignment, it looks like the middle picture and then parallel misalignment. I don't think we have as much, but it, it basically axial and coronal deformities will give you misalignment that that will basically make patella instability, make the patient more prone for patella instability. In looking at the knee itself, it's good to understand is there an effusion in the knee? Is there potentially a cartilage or cartilaginous injury to the knee? Um, understand the, or, or look for the J sign. The J sign is basically when the patella inflection um, locates into the trochlea and an extension, it basically subluxes laterally. The apprehension sign is, is, is a nice way to see whether the patient has got um, symptoms or whether the patient is, is worried about the patella dislocating. And then obviously um, translation of the patella um, laterally, you can grade that in, in terms of percentage, but that's a nice way to, to see how far you can pull the patella laterally. You need to exclude other pathologies in the knee, sometimes very tricky, especially in an acute phase of acute dislocation where the knee is very swollen and painful. It's sometimes very difficult to exclude um, cruciate ligament injuries or menis meniscal injuries. And that's really where the MRI comes in, into play especially because most of these clinical tests have fairly poor inter-observer reliability. So none of us would be agreeing on, on, the, on these various tests in a certain patient um, would be assess our, our, our examination against each other. So that's why it's, it's, it's nice to have an MRI scan or a CT scan in these patients. And what you can get out of that is to understand if there's patella alta, trochlear morphology, whether there's uh, rotational or axial alignment issues, and to see, to understand whether there is um, associated injuries. 
So it basically shows us the anatomy and um, the bony morphology of, of the patella and the patella and the trochlea. Ardent is a very um, famous knee or patella femoral um, expert in America. And she basically says that if there is trochlear dysplasia and patella tilt, more than 20 um, degrees, that, that, that is considered a high risk of dislocation. The CT scan can show you mainly axial um, malalignment. So if you're worried in your x-ray, in your, in your exam, that there is malalignment, it's nice to have a CT scan if you're planning to address it surgically to really plan your surgery. And there you can basically assess for rotational alignment and malalignment in the hip, in the knee, in the, in the tibia, and also look at the trochlea and see if there's, a, within the trochlea, if there's a trochlea dysplasia. And you can assess the TTDG, which is basically um, another very good measurement to, to see what the, what the malalignment in terms of axial malalignment is. But that I'll, I'll, I'll talk about just now. So with these CT features, these are basically um, a risk of dislocations on, on the x-axis and on the y-axis. Um, you can basically see the, the measurements. So let's say there is a TTTG, so a tibial tubercle trochlear groove distance of more than 25 um, millimeters, then you would have a 10% chance of a dislocation. This is patella, average patella height. If you see if this is a, um, an index that we'll talk about just now, if that index goes beyond 1.2 or 1.4, you see again a 10% um, risk of dislocation. And the same, the same for this graph. If, if you hit uh, an average patella tilt of more than 20 degrees to 30 degrees, you're starting again another 10% of risk of dislocation. And this would be for patella deviation laterally. So in the end, it's never just one of these um, factors. It's usually a combination of these factors that make the risk of instability um, grow. But this is if you would unpack it into the individual risk factors. The TTTG is something that Shetley came up with, who I'm sure is going to come up again when we speak about the MPFL. But that's basically the distance between the groove of the uh, trochlea and the tibial tuberosity. So you would have to scroll down until you see the deepest part of the, on the MRI scan, on X axial MRI or CT scans, you scroll to the point where you can see the deepest point of the tibial, of the trochlea groove that's basically perpendicular to the posterior axis of the posterior medialis, the posterior um, condyles, and then you scroll until you see the tibia and then you can measure the tibial tuberosity and then you can measure that distance. And that distance shows you basically what the, um, um, what the, what, what the tibial, tor what the tibial torsional axial malalignment of the patella is. Um, the trochlea is something you can look at x-rays when you look at sunrise views and a sulcus angle of more than 145 degrees is considered to be a shallow or dysplastic trochlea. What we worry about is a, a trochlea that's convex of, or, or basically flat or convex. Then we are actually thinking about trochleoplasties. But a nice way to look at the trochlea is actually not on the sunrise views, but more on the lateral views. And this is De Jour from France, and he classified uh, trochlear dysplasia by looking at the lateral x-rays. It's a little bit uh, cumbersome to look at his um, classification, but mainly what, what he talks about is um, the, the, he defines the anatomic um, um, lines that you can see on lateral x-ray, which it's basically the continuation of the Blumenthal's line, which is the, the floor of the trochlea. And then you can see both condyles, medial and lateral condyle, form lines as well. And if those lines cross, then you know that the trochlea is not deep enough. If you see a little hump here, it means that there is a little supratrochlear spur. And that is actually, when you look at it, it looks 
on in in um, during the operation it really looks like a little bump and that's a problem for the patella when the patella tries to grow, go to track into the uh, trochlea when it hits this bump it, it wants to jump um, lateral so um, De Jure classifies four different types of this um, of this uh, trochlear dysplasia, but for us the main um, signs to look for is the crossing sign. That means the patella is shallow, uh, the trochlea is shallow, and the super patella, the super trochlear spur. The double contour, you can see it at the best. You can see it here. So the double contour actually means that the medial um, that the lateral um, that there is a hypoplasia there's a hypoplasia um, of the medial um, um, condyle and you can actually see that um, as, as, as part of a double contour <sighs> so on MRI scan you can also look at this uh, trochlear spur and you can also measure the um, sulcus angle the patella height can be measured with various different ways. The main thing is you can measure the patella height against the tibia or you can measure it against the femur or anatomic landmarks of the femur or the tibia. The most commonly used is the insult salvati, which looks at the entire length of the patella and relates that to um, the distal pole of the patella and to the distance of the distal pole of the patella and the insertion of the patella tendon. The Blackburn and Peel and Insan Salvati, uh, Cato de Jean and Insan Salvati are the ones that I use most common because they, they, they have similar ratios. It's usually anything more than 1.2 or 1.3 is a telehalter. Um, direct measures would be if you relate the patella against an anatomic landmark on the femur and be that described an overlap of the cartilage, so the cartilage of the patella versus the cartilage of the trochlea. And if that overlap of this cartilage is less than 12%, then it would be a patella alta. So if this patella moves proximal, we will have less and less cartilage overlap of the two. And then as soon as that hits 12% of the entire length of the patella cartilage, it becomes patella alta. So that's basically how I would look at um, patella instability in assessing it both with numbers or, or with basically mainly with movement. Um, if you guys have any questions, you must let me know. Is there any questions? Let me just um, stop sharing. I hope you guys, I hope I, um, I, I haven't lost anyone. So you guys are all um, muted. Um, you know what, then I'll ask a question. And maybe uh, to Richard or Dave, are you guys um, able to speak, Richard and Dave? Yeah, yeah, Mark. Okay, cool. So um, my question to you is, firstly, Patella alta is something that obviously you can measure and something that um, people say you can see when the patella does, has a J sign. Is that something that you address um, or when would you address patella alta? When you measure it or when you see it as a J sign? Uh, what so indication do you address it surgically? Yeah, so for, for myself, I, I think I have a fairly low threshold to address it. And it's a common. So I, I use MRI, so I use the um, BIOT index, and I want to see to measure it and see that it's there. But clinically, I also measured from the lateral plateau, and I, I, I've now sort of worked it on my fingers the height, and then I want to jace, I want to see a positive J sign. Um, so I need both to do it. But if it is there, then I will address it at the same time. Okay, Richard, you. Um Mike, I think you uh, touched on very nicely the fact that it's uh, the art. I mean, you didn't, I mean, you didn't just sort of hammer that home, but I think a lot of it is art. So, so you're going to see a fair skinned skinny female with anterior knee pain and relative instability and a J sign. 
you're just going to train her BMO and her glute medius, you know, you're not going to do anything surgical. And that's sort of the art of relative, what's her symptoms, what's her function, what does she want to do? So I agree with, I think you've got to use all the measures. And I think Dave's certainly more clued up than you and me in, when it comes to surgically addressing these. Um, but the art part's very important. You've got to look at what they're presenting with and what you can manage without actually doing anything orthopedic, you know, more rehab, physio, biokinetic. I think that's the yeah. art part. When you say rehab, and that's already going into the next kind of talk where we only discuss surgical options, so maybe it's nice to speak about the rehab quickly. Um, obviously, especially when there's pain, patellofemoral pain, it's worth to really spend a lot of time on non-surgical management. Um, what is the rehabilitation protocol or what, you know, what, what do you focus on, Richard and Dave? Um, you said glute medius, you know, why glute medius? Why not VMO? So my understanding, and I'm not a rehab specialist, is that glute medius and, and VMO co-contract, much like triceps and, and pec major um, for most activities. So if you don't strengthen the one, you, you really don't strengthen up the other one properly. And glute medius is the external rotator of the hip, and the VMO is the... Um, it applies medial traction to the patella, so the two sort of stabilizing forces that you want to do to correct those classic weaknesses or deformities, which are a bit of both. Um, okay. But I mean, you hear again and again with someone with anterior knee pain how their glutes don't activate. Yeah. I just think it's key to spend 18 months on that patient with physio or platelets or whatever it is before you consider surgery because uh, they can get better. Okay. Dave, uh, another question to you is, um, you know, it's easiest for us, and maybe it's also nice to talk about that again when we, when we listen to um, Johan, but it's easiest for us to just do an MPFL reconstruction because, you know, we know 80 or 90% of the patients get better, but it's very difficult to pick out the 10% or 20% beforehand. So before we do the first procedure to pick them out and say, okay, well, you will do better with more and what do you look for Dave and what do you look for to kind of understand that these patients need more not just an MPFL um, yeah Mark so firstly I, I just want to get back to Richard's point I agree completely about rehab so I think especially when you get in a system where people have easy access to specialist you know orthopedic surgeons they often come with not being optimized. And I think if you don't optimize them with good rehab, as Richard said, with glutes and, and quads, um, you're going to have a bad surgical outcome and you're going to operate on people unnecessarily. And I think an unhappy patellofemoral patient is, a, is always going to haunt you and always going to be an unhappy patient. So you really got to fail management to get surgery. Okay. So that was your microphone. <laughs> bang. Um, bang. I think someone must have taken him off. Did mm -hmm. I? I must have I must have muted I must have muted him. Uh, hey? can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Um yeah, so firstly I don't know if you heard any of that, but Yeah, I did. Um, you did. Okay. And then so secondly, the it so it comes down to a combination of imaging so uh, MRI and, and and clinical and there's a few subtle things with the, the trochlear dysplasia so they often have a more c-shaped sign of of patella tracking and then i want to see that they have that severe dysplasia um so either dome shaped or lateral facing trochlear with the uh, super patella um with the spur and um and i think in those groups so when they've taken those patients who've had mpfls in either severe alter or ones with severe dysplasia, those are the ones that fail. And it's because you can't overcome those, those forces. And they've shown that in those patients, um, the, if you do the, 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 the uh, osteotomy or the trochleoplasty as a salvage procedure, they have worse outcomes than if you did it as, as the primary procedure. So I think in the a la carte type approach that we'll hear a lot about, you really got to pick your surgery that is going to give the best outcome first um, when you do decide to operate. Okay. 
Um, thanks, Dave. I think a la carte is the key now and, and, and the trigger now for the next talk. Um, Johan, are you ready? Um, yes, Johan, I'm ready. Okay, perfect. So maybe just share your screen and then you can, you can start as soon as you're ready. Okay. Okay, so uh, Michael asked me just to uh, basically run through all the procedures available to, you know, to present the menu. And then let's see how far we'll get before Michael cuts my microphone off also. Uh, a lot of it will be revision uh, from what Michael said. And uh, Dave and uh, Richard are still talking about MPFR reconstruction as well as trochleoplasty. So I'm just quickly going to brush over that. Uh, so just as an introduction, Michael spoke about the, the anatomy and the biomechanics, but important to know that, uh, that your tracking is determined by a Q angle and the relationship between your patella and femur. So uh, that takes into account the, uh, the trochlea, the patella itself, as well as um, the height, so alta or a baja. And Jan, Jan, I can't, I can't see, so if you are sharing your screen, I cannot see your screen yet. Oh, shucks. Um, Just uh, say, you know, on, on, on the top, okay. once you share it, you can click um, yeah, on, on the bottom right corner of, the, you know, if you click on the green button. Yeah, I'm running, you, I'm, I'm running multiple monitors. I think that was the problem. So as soon as you basically, as soon as you click the monitor or the, yeah. that's, you know, the screen that you want to share, you need to press share on the bottom right of that window. Uh, can you guys see? Let's see. Cannot. Uh, alternatively, we can also. Um, so, let's see if I do it. Let's see. She. Yeah, I think you have to stop sharing your screen first, Michael. Yeah, my sh my screen isn't shared. Is it okay? Uh, you know what we can do? Okay, can yeah. you see now? Yeah. Yes, now we can. Now you just need to start your, you need to just start your, um, your PowerPoint presentation. Then we don't see the, you know. Uh, like a, out of presenter view. Yeah, if you click presenter view, or we can just keep it like that. It's also okay. Yeah. Well, now you have to go back to it. How's that? I can't see it. <laughs> um, rather, rather just go back to what you had and then we'll just take it from there. Okay. Now I can see the entire screen. Okay, good. And now? Okay, now you can, now, yes, perfect. Okay, cool. Good, okay. Okay, so uh, patella tracking, uh, that's basically determined by your Q angle and your patella femoral relationship. Uh, and Michael spoke about the Dejour classification of uh, trochlear dysplasia. But when it comes to uh, patella dislocation, it's determined by three things in my mind to simplify it. So your Q angle, the relationship between your patella and femur, as well as the MPFL ligament. So to start off with the uh, MPFL, medial patella femoral ligament, I'm quickly going to go over this because I think Richard has a, he's gonna discuss this in depth for about 15 minutes. Uh, but like Michael said, it's a main stabilizer in zero to 30 degrees, uh, because that's basically when your patella is exposed. It's above the trochlea, there's no, bony um, check reins or borders keeping it in place. So it can go medial or lateral. Once you start to flex, the uh, trochlea takes over that role. Um, so it's a check rein to dislocation in extension. Um, and repairs do poorly unless it's peeled off the patella. So reconstruction is a, a better option. So you select your patient, you know, if it's a, if it's a chronic dislocating patella and uh, there's no bony abnormality, or tracking problems, etc. If it's just a ruptured medial patella femoral ligament, you can consider this procedure. Um, some anatomy from La Prade, the, uh, the footprint on the patella is 17 millimeters. And there, if you can see, it's basically a fan, 
I think they call it a fan, no, an hourglass structure. So it's broad on the patella. And the, the basically middle point of this is 41% from proximal to distal. So it's slightly more proximal than distal. It attaches, uh, the attachment is 17 millimeters thick on average. Then it becomes thinner and it widens again. Um, and I'll speak about the attachment point, and I'm sure Richard will also speak about that. That might be important for the exam. So to repair this, you need to harvest the tendon, um, drill, uh, drill tunnels through the patella. There you can see is an oblique, oblique tunnel. Uh, transverse tunnels have fallen out of favor because it's associated with uh, uh, fractures. You can use mineral oil to pass, uh, basically to pass your graft. Some people use a single strand. Uh, but I think most people nowadays use a double strand, so it has two attachment sites on the patella and one on the femur. Then you pass it through and the attachment on the femur is very important. Um, this repair is not isometric. It's not, uh, uh, the tightness it's is not the same in flexion and extension. You want it to be tightest from zero to 30 degrees because that's when, um, basically that's when you need its function. Um, and you don't have to dissect down and expose the whole medial part of the femur. You can use shuttle point, uh, which is a radio, uh, radiographic marker. Three lines, one is on the posterior cortex of the femur. Line two is basically where this posterior cortex becomes the uh, epicondyles. And line three is where Blumensart line ends. So you take the three lines in the middle of it and two millimeters anterior to line one is normally where uh, shuttle's point is. Uh, and then you drill your hole and that is where you attach uh, the MPFL on the femur side. And important, before you, um, before you tighten it, you test the isometry. So you can either do it with a nylon or you can pass your tendon through and then you cycle the knee from flexion to extension. You want it to be tightest from zero to 30. Okay, I'm not going to spend more time on this. I'm sure Richard will tell us more. Then when it comes to patella tracking, Michael told us about the Q angle. Uh, important, especially for the exam candidates, you measure it from the aces over the patella and you're supposed to measure it in 30 degrees of flexion and down to the tibial tubercle. So that's your Q angle. So you can see normal uh, is around 15 degrees. If you have valgus knees, it's more. And then you can see the vector of the pull is lateral. Just imagine this is a string. You know, the string has a little bit of a bend in it. If you pull on both sides of the string, that string wants to straighten. So the patella wants to go lateral. Uh, so you can improve this with tibial tubercle osteotomies. You osteotomize a tibial tubercle and you move it. Um, and there's a quick indication. If your TTTG that Michael spoke about is more than 20 millimeters, you medialize it. If you have patella alta, you can distalize it. Or the, for chondral lesions, etc., combinations of these, um, you, can, uh, you can use a combination. And how I, for the registrars, if you get confused between alta and baja, if you've ever been to Venice and you were unlucky enough to go to San Marco Piazza during high tide, it's called Aqua Alta. So just remember, uh, Alta means high. Okay, Fulkerson osteotomy. Sorry, that was a, a slide uh, by error. Start with a uh, Mackay osteotomy or Mackey. It was first described in 1963 and is basically an anteriorization of the tubercle. There you can see you, you do an osteotomy. Uh, you anteriorize it and you use a bone graft behind it to keep it in place. Um, it's, been pro uh, it's been proven to reduce your patellofemoral joint contact portions and the ind indication for this would be if you have patellofemoral pain, a moderate arthritis or post patellectomy pain. And the technique is to do the osteotomy from the medial side. It's about 150 millimeters long and about 8 millimeters deep. Then you elevate it and fill it with an ilia crest bone graft. And just to take note, sometimes because you add volume, it can be difficult to close the skin over this osteotomy. The Elmsley Trilla or Trilla osteotomy was described by Rue first, and I'm not sure why Elmsley Trilla uh, connected their names to this procedure, but also about a year after the Mackey osteotomy. And it's for medialization of the tibial tubercle. You also approach it from the medial side. Um, you make the osteotomy, you can leave a soft tissue sleeve attached on the lateral side for uh, basically um, blood supply to the, uh, to the osteotomized part. And uh, that improves your Q angle. 
but if you have chondromalacia of the patella, it has poor outcomes. Uh, yeah, we've discussed the technique. And then the Fulkerson osteotomy is a, is a combination. It took them basically 19 years since, uh, since Mackey uh, and Elmsley Trillard described there 19 years afterwards. Uh, Fulkerson described this osteotomy. So it's a, it's a combination. Um, and that's for patellofemoral pain, maltracking and instability, excessive tilt, patellofemoral arthritis, uh, and if you have lateral and distal wear of the arthritis. Um, so this uh, not only improves your tracking, but also your Q angle. And how you approach this is you have to approach, you have to expose the lateral side, and uh, then you have to elevate the tibialis anterior muscle. Uh, very important to elevate it off the whole lateral side. So you can view basically where your osteotomy is going to end. That's about the end point. You expose it, you can put Kragos or Homans in, in that place. Um, and that's to protect your artery and nerve. You start the osteotomy from medial, you cut down, and then you can play with your angle. If you want to medialize it more, you can make it a more horizontal osteotomy. If you want to anteriorize it more, you can make the incision more vertical. Okay, and then just some complications. Uh, uh, major complications is tubercle fractures, non-unions, if you overcorrected, um, infection and neurovascular injuries. Okay, so for rotational osteotomies, that's mostly uh, like Michael described, if you do your Craig's test and you see uh, malalignment is the cause of the patellofemoral uh, maltracking, then you must consider a rotational osteotomy, um, a derotation osteotomy, sorry. And again, I want to refer that picture. Uh, so, uh, sorry, it's not only rotational, but, and you can incorporate, if you, if you have a valgus knee, you can also incorporate uh, uh, your coronal plane into it as well. Uh, so there was a study by Imhoff. He did distal femoral osteotomies. They did a, a very high number. I think they did 266 over 16 years, but uh, 44 knees um, met their in inclusion criteria. Uh, so for 44 knees, uh, maltracking and uh, uh, dislocations, they did distal or derotation osteotomies. And for 22 knees, they added a valgus correction as well. So, um, they added MPFL, strochleoplasties, and arthroplasties for same patients. And they found that after these procedures, some only, well, 22 only had isolated derotation osteotomies. None of them de uh, re-dislocated. Uh, the pain improved on a visual analog score, and you can see the Womack, Lissolm, and IKDC scores increased dramatically or statistically significant for the Lissolm and IKDC scores. So um, select your patient. Uh, it's obviously a bigger procedure than just putting a, a MPFL in, but uh, it has a dramatic effect. Okay, then patellofemoral arthroplasty. Uh, it's not without complications, so definitely I have to uh, do it for the right uh, patients. The, uh, the first generation of implants had a very high failure rate, so it has a bad reputation because of that. Uh, the first generation of implants only tried to resurface the femoral chondral area, and they found that that was a mistake. So the second generation, you make a deeper femoral cut, and you replace the cartilage as well as subchondral bone. And with this, you get a broader trochlear surface, you can uh, improve the valgus tracking and also adjust the rotation on the femur, you can, uh, or the external rotation. Indications for this procedure is very important. For It's for primary or post-traumatic uh, isolated patellofemoral joint OA. And uh, patients with any tibiofemoral OA in the medial or the lateral compartment should be excluded. Then a, a unia or a total knee replacement is rather advised. Also, if there's any malalignment or inflammatory arthritis, this procedure should not be done. And then with the second generation component, if it's done for the right reason, the revision rate is still, was still 9.5%. It was a little bit lower for the, the Avon implant, but so be aware of that. Almost 10% of your patient will need a revision to a, a union or total uh, at five years. Okay, then... Trochleoplasty, I'm ending with trochleoplasty and Dave is speaking about that, so just a quick uh, run over. Uh, and as Michael's also you know, spoke about the de jure classification, uh, it's indicated for patients with trochleoplasty, that's symptomatic due to the trochleoplasty, and it's basically reshaping of your trochlea. It can be done open or arthroscopic. 
and uh, and although it is effective to decrease the sulcus angle and stability, uh, a lot of patients still have a high percentage of post-op uh, pain and osteoarthritis. And there you can see if you have a flat or dysplastic trochlea, um, you can reshape it and you can either fix it with uh, biabsorbable screws, staples, or, or tight ropes. Okay, and that's it from my side. Thank you very much, Johan. Well done. It's a very nice overview. Um, so I think number one, what I just want to just add or, or say to that is that we have to be, you know, we have to understand that there's uh, ways, surgical options that, you know, that we can do for, uh, maybe just unshare your screen. Uh, so you just, and, and, you know, you just basically press unshare. Um, so there's basically procedures that we do for instability, and then there's procedures that are mainly there for pain. So arthroplasty is mainly um, a, a triggered or indicated with patella pain and um, patella femoral arthritis. It doesn't sort out instability. Um, and um, the, other, the, other thing, the other thing to add is that the MPFL is basically just a check ring. It's a leash, like a dog's leash. When the patella runs too far, you can catch it, but it's not going to sort out tracking. So for that, you need distal or proximal realignment procedures that um, Johan spoke about. So we need to kind of find ways to either make the trochlea deeper or to move the tibial tubercle in a way that the, the patella tracks better. If you just do an MPFL in, in someone that has a uh, severe trochlear dysplasia or uh, a, a large TDDG um, it, or Q angle, it's not going to work. Um, Richard, I've got a question for you. You actually very, so you, I think you're quite conservative with your bony procedures in, um, in you know, in, um, in instability, in, in patellofemoral instability. What are your indications um, for adding a tibial tubercle osteotomy? And if so, what type of tibial tubercle osteotomies do you prefer? So, Mike, you're correct. I'm, I'm very conservative. Um, with with uh, most of these patients who have, um, well, a lot of the patients have this case are young or children. And so I don't want to do anything bony. And then whether it's a child or an adult, I certainly, if I have a choice of a procedure, where if it fails, they none the better, but none the worse. Um, I'm biased to choosing that rather than something that I do that might be irreversible. So as soon as I address bone, I get I start to consider that I'm doing something irreversible. Um, I mean, I definitely heard Dave say earlier that we we shouldn't be under treating, um, but I think my natural bias to all things surgical is conservative. So. The majority of my patients are soft tissue only because if it if it fails, I can do a soft tissue and a bony procedure, and um, they have to have significant rotational malalignment or uh, bony abnormalities, a trochlear dysplasia, for me to consider bony. And the majority of them, uh, I would consider referring. But I, I think even yourself, Dave, myself, we don't see many in a year, maybe one, maybe two, that I think need bony procedures. Mm. Depends on how aggressive you are, uh, Richard. <laughs> <laughs> Dave, um, you and I are much, much younger than um, and, and uh, than Richard, and much, much more aggressive. <laughs> although, although it doesn't look like it. Um, what are you? So, I know Dave that you're a little bit more um, aggressive when it comes to bony procedures. So, when do you decide? Um, to add a trochleoplasty, so okay, a tibial tubercle osteotomy. So Richard basically says, do the MPFL first. If it fails, we still have, we didn't burn any bridges. We can still address then a patella altar or a J sign um, with, a, with a bony procedure. 
Um, what is your indication? And we spoke about it a little bit um, before Johann talk. What's your indication and what type of typical typical osteotomy do you do for um, in, in patients with instability of the patella? Um, yeah, like so, Richard, and that we the majority of instabilities don't need a bony procedure. So majority of them. The majority have dysplasia, but it's not severe. And NTFR works for 90% of patients. But if they have a significant ulcer, so I use Pilot with a J sign, I will then at my primary procedure add in osteotomy, physical osteotomy. I differentiate my osteotomies for pain and instability. So with instability, I, unless there's a TTTG more than 25 millimeters, and I also don't want severe dysplasia. So for me, the TTTG is, I think, measuring the a large point of the time is measuring the wrong side of that measurement, that measuring the tubercle. But we actually know that we've got a abnormal trochlea that's more medial, um, facing is not lateral enough. So we it's measuring. The, so more lateral, so it's measuring often the wrong side of that. So if we do an MPFL reconstruction with a medialization of the cubicle, we are... Dave, you have to, um, just please, uh, you, uh, I was really keen to hear this now, but you have to speak into the microphone. I think you you kind of, the microphone you is... Um, so sorry, we lost I you. Can you hear me now? I can hear you very well now, yeah. So we okay, lost sorry about you. that. We last year, you know, the, uh, you basically trying to um, let us know when you when you would do the um, tibial tubero uh, tuberosity osteotomy. Tibial okay, tubercle so, osteotomy. So, if, um, so if they've got, I differentiate my osteotomies between um, yeah. those for pain and, and, and those for instability. And so for instability, I have a much lower threshold. So I do it with the BIDOT index and then clinically with the J sign and I test for ulcer and then I distalize. Um, okay. Unless I'll add a slight medialization if there's a TTTG greater than 25 with not sort of severe dysplasia. Because then the, 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 for me, the, the TTTG, everyone looks at the tubercle side of it, but we know we've got an abnormal trochlea. Yeah. So if you don't take the abnormal trochlea into account, you're correcting the, in, the wrong side of that, yeah. of that measurement. Um, so primarily for instability, I do a distalization and it's based on those measurements. And then for, uh, for pain, you, you do for a, pain. I'll, a, I'll, a, so if they, if I, I'll do a, a scope first, if I'm worried about pain and I'm thinking of doing an osteotomy, if they've got sort of lateral conflicts with lateral patella wear, then I end with alter, then I'll medialize with it because I'm wanting to unload that lateral side. But uh, that, that if, you know, obviously if they don't have instability, then I'm not doing an MPFL with that. So yeah. when I do an MPFL with a osteotomy, I'm very concerned that I'm going to overload the medial side. Um, and uh, so I, I, that's why I don't, generally medialize because if you overload that medial side of the patella, they get pain and early arthritis and they're very unhappy patients. So I think you've got to be okay. careful about medializing with your osteotomy and instability. So for everyone, the, the reason to distalize the, the, the tibial tubercle is basically to make the patella engage earlier into the, um, into the trochlea. And, and therefore the MPFL doesn't have to check grain um, for a, a, a longer uh, flexion arc. Um, okay, well, that's thank you very much, guys. Um, I I'm always keen to to do more bony procedures, but like like Richard, I've uh, you know I've I've burned my fingers a few times with having um, non unions and and screw protrusions and you know problems with kneeling. But it's still it's just such a nice procedure if it works because the pain, the pain, uh, you know, is or the instability and pain is often related to the maltracking. Um, 
Richard, do you want to go on and, and discuss the MPFL reconstruction that you do? Sure, but I just want to say, I just want to point out what you just said is that, you know, you, when you're doing the bony procedures, you're often addressing pain. Uh, you, it's less likely that you're addressing instability. Um, I mean, you, yes, you do, but it's, uh, with, when you're purely talking about instability, you're less likely to do a bony procedure. Yeah. Hello, Anya. Um, I also, I also um, Richard, just by the way, it's just a fantastic um, a jersey you've got on. Really, really nice. Um, uh, and now you're doing it for the right to the thing. triple room. <laughs> okay, let's let's listen to your talk. Okay, let's. Okay. Uh, can you, Mike, can you see it now? Yes, I can. You can probably start with the PowerPoint presentation and we'll be able to just see the, yeah, yeah. but I can see it now. Okay. So, um, you know, in terms of patellofemoral instability, much like so much else in orthopedics, it's all um, uh, lack of consensus. Is everyone's got their uh, own plan. Um, and this beautiful picture is from Michael found. So it's the same person. It's just our perspective on, on how we want to understand it. And it's very much the same with all our uh, perspectives and the same with particular locations. So um, let's go directly into MPFL and whether or not it's a, a valid procedure, but more importantly, how to do it. So um, as we've mentioned already, most cases of patellar dislocation actually going to do well with non-surgical treatment. Um, and the only ones, the acute ones, the only ones, acute ones where you really need to start considering surgery the first time is when they've knocked off an osteochondral fragment that you need to fix. And when this is the case, you've got to then uh, stabilize them with an MPFL reconstruction. So in terms of bony surgery, that's uh, the tibial tubical osteotomies and the trochlear uh, plasties, those aren't really very commonly after a primary dislocation. Um, and this is a sort of detailed planning for a patellar instability. So let's break it down. An acute patellar dislocation, if you've got no osteochondral injury, you're going to treat it conservatively. If you have an osteochondral fracture, usually a patellar fracture knocked off, but also possibly a lateral trochlea, then I'll do an arthroscopic or open uh, osteochondral fixation and an MPFL reconstruction. Um, but not a tibial typical osteotomy in the vast majority. There's multiple articles, let's just mention one. You heard about Elizabeth Arendt earlier. She's um, from Minneapolis and she's regarded as the, the queen of patellofemoral and David de Jour from France is the king of patellofemoral. That's what they call each other. And um, she's got this very nice article with Julian Filler from Australia and Andrew Amos, the anatomist from England, um, where they show that this is the, the primary passive soft tissue restraint. You saw Michael's beautiful anatomy pictures on um, the various other restraints, but that this is the primary restraint is important to remember, and it's also the most reliably uh, surgically reconstructed restraint. So we're going to focus purely on MPFL reconstruction, not the tibial attachment, not the VMO attachment, not the meniscal attachment. Then historically, there was some enthusiasm for retinacular repairs. Um, and this is by a good crew, you know, Viola and Schottel, et cetera. But as you heard already, and I agree 100% with you, Han, even though they regard it as an effective technique to address patellofemoral um, instability, I think it's really gone out of favor because of good, good evidence to show that repair alone, so, you know, an imbrication or sutures has significantly inferior results to a reconstruction. And then there's multiple articles, I'll just touch on some, that show that MPFL reconstruction alone is sufficient to restore instability, but that's reconstruction, not repair. Um, sometimes you do need a typical tubical osteotomy, um, and if you're careful, it can relieve the load on the MPFL, but you heard from Dave that if you do it, if you, if you um, do it incorrectly, you can increase the load on your new reconstruction and increase your chance of failure. So an MPFL, regardless of your bony alignment or anatomy, um, if you've got, lateral soft tissue slackness with a deficient MPFL, I mean, lateral, medial soft tissue, that's an incorrect spelling, medial soft tissue slackness 
with a deficient empathy file, you need, you need to reconstruct it. And the other procedures you can add, as you heard, a la carte. And in the majority, roughly 90%, um, MPFL alone uh, removes the need for any bony procedures. So I'm going to touch on just the anatomy of it, um, the layers, the origin, the insertion and tensioning. So Robert Leprade from Vale and now um, he's moved to uh, Minneapolis as well, is sort of the king of uh, anatomic dissections, anatomic destructions, uh, 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 anatomic articles and he's described it as have many others, but the important thing is it's superficial to the joint. It's an extra articular structure. It's a distinct extra articular layer. And you can see from the top picture um, that it is attached to the vastus medialis obliquus. And it, you also heard very nicely from Johan, it's quite a broad ligament, particularly it's, it's patella attachment. So that patella attachment, we have, I agree that um, you've got to do probably a double stranded attachment to your um, patella in order to reconstruct something that, the, that is this broad. You must remember it attaches in the proximal two thirds of the patella. So if you um, attach it too distal, you're going to create abnormal uh, dynamics for that patella when it's moving. So just look at that. You can see if the, the bigger arrow demonstrating the whole of the patella and the smaller arrow demonstrating how far down the center of that attachment is on the patella. And then your tibial attachment, and this has got so many subtleties to it and nuances. Um, and let's try and sort of narrow that down a little bit. The thing we all look for is the medial epicondyle when we're reconstructing, and it's roughly speaking a centimeter proximal and posterior to that. But also if you look at the, the writing lower down, it's just anterior and distal to the adductor tubercle. And I'm going to come back to that a bit more. So if you look at it, we zoomed in, look at that um, knee from the side. Here's your medial epicondyle, which we all look for. And if you go one centimeter proximal and then posterior, that's your anatomic attachment. But when you, in that sort of bun fight of soft tissue and blood, that's often hard to accurately locate. And if you look at that adductor tubercle, it's right there. And the adductor tubercle can be very easy to uh, anatomically locate surgically, because if you take just your standard um, artery forceps and stick it under the adductor tendon, then it shows you very clearly by putting traction on that adductor tendon where the adductor tubercle is, where it attaches in your surgical field. And then if you come just distal and anterior to that, and literally two, two millimeters, two millimeters, you're probably in the right area. And that's sometimes a more reproducible anatomic landmark than the medial epicondyle. So, there's the point you want to put it, but remember it's actually located lo closer to the adductor tubercle than the medial epicondyle. So what area is more forgiving? You know, if you put it in the wrong place, where do you want to err to? So if you put it in a more proximal position than it should be, that increases MPFL tension as the knee flexes, which is the opposite, because this is an anisometric ligament. So it's not isometric throughout the full range of motion. So Putting it too proximal tightens it in flexion, which is contrary to the native. It in fact, loosens as it gets into flexion. You heard in the first 15 to 25 degrees of flexion was the MPFL, MPFL is at its tightest. So a more distal attachment um, on the femur will increase that tension in extension, which is probably correct. So the femoral position should be not too proximal or too posterior to the anatomic site. So that's too proximal and too posterior to this epicondyle, I mean, sorry, to this adductor tubercle. See, that's adductor tubercle there. That's medial epicondyle down here. So the fail-safe position is just proximal and medial to the epicondyle. So if you don't come too far proximal and too far posterior, it's probably a more forgiving position to err uh, into. So if you do that, which is not quite anatomic, the um, tension in the MPFL will be more forgiving than if you put it too proximal and too posterior. So remember, if you over constrain this MPFL, you will capture that joint as it goes into flexion and you create an anterior patellofemoral loading and anterior pain. Then you've seen the sort of physical anatomic landmarks and it's been mentioned already the, the radiologic landmarks. Um, this is a little bit controversial because Werner van der Merwe from Bloemfontein did 22 dissections um, of cadaver knees 
and found this to be a bit unreliable and demonstrated well, in fact, when a prize for his presentation at the International Knee Meeting in Rio many years ago. So I still think it's a good landmark and I still think it's a checkpoint, but you should still be trying to anatomically locate it and then confirm or, or double confirm your position with your radiological landmarks, which I mentioned earlier. So in terms of the surgery, I always start with an examination and anesthetic. You can see this is very unstable. This is one finger, this thing's coming right out the side, which is what you want to be able to see. So then I still do an arthroscopic assessment. You want to look at um, where it's loaded, where the cartilage damage is, where the softening is, where the fibrillation is. Um, remember all articular cartilage that's had a trauma or overload softens um, because the glycosamine and glycan content drops and you're trying to stabilize that situation so that it can heal or firm up. Then I won't go into detail into graft harvest, but um, you've all seen Mike do these landmarks um, for the medial hamstrings. And I think it's important that you harvest just gracilis. Gracilis uh, in isolation is bigger and stronger than the uh, native MPFL. So an, a gracilis harvest alone is more than sufficient. I'm not going to let that whole video play. Then in terms of fixation into um, the bone, it was mentioned earlier, and I like interference screws. So you can use anchors, but the strongest pull-out strength is an interference screw. Um, this way you can drill holes into your patella, which do not go the full way across. So you can drill in just uh, 18 mils as opposed to going right across your patella and therefore avoid um, the risk of a drill hole that goes right the way through and thus a possibility of a post-operative patella fracture. So you've got to expose that um, medial pole of the patella and you focus more on the proximal two thirds of the patella and you're going to put in, I agree with what Johan said, this is an older um, image, but he's saying more 18 mils apart. And as I go between 12 and 18 mils apart, depending on the size of the patient and their patella. And I'm drilling blind ending tunnels into which I use an interference screw to fix the gracilis graft and fix both ends into it um, once I'm confirmed and I'm happy with my position with the interference screw. And then you end up with a loop attached to the medial border of the patella, um, which you can traction and then pass down to the, your, your incision of the medial epicondyle. It's very important that this uh, reconstruction is an attempt to be anatomic, so it must pass between the second and third fascial layers. So you'll, it's quite easy to locate at the level of the patella, your size skin, go through fat, and then the first sort of fascial layer, your hips is your second layer, and you wanna be just deep to that, and uh, below that is your third layer, and if you violate that, you start to enter joint which you don't want to be. This is not an intra-articular, it's an extra-articular ligament, and that's an extra-articular uh, reconstruction. Then once you've decided on the anatomy of your femoral tunnel, again, um, you can prepare it with the first with your beef pin. The advantage of putting this beef pin in first is you can check for your relative isometry or an isometry, that if the MPFL is tight in extension, in the first few degrees of, of flexion and in extension, and doesn't over constrain your patella. Remember, this is a check rein uh, ligament. So it, it's not tight to any of the full range. It's, it only pulls tight when that patella starts to shift laterally in extension. Um, oh no, it's not gonna, uh, it's gonna play. So and then you can pass your, your graft through um, to the other side and, and then apply traction with the suture on the other side. And then in terms of tensioning, remember non-isometric or anisometric, maximum tension in full extension. So the MPFL tightens extension as the quadriceps muscles contracts, it pulls that patella more proximally, then it becomes um, tight and then it slackens in flexion. So if you look at this, that's, you can see the VMO in this video of the dissection I've done, that as I proximalize that patella, the VMO becomes tight and visible. Um, I just want to play that again, but in flexion, it becomes slack. So as I proximalize the patella, look at that VMO become tight. So the way I tighten the MPFL ligament is, is in extension and have my assistant maximally proximalize the patella in extension. So that's a, a spike Erasmus technique. Um, because of 
the fact that that's where it's supposed to be at its tightest. And then I put the screw halfway in, make sure I haven't over captured the joint and then put it the rest of the way in. And I, I think there's many ways to skin a cat. This again being just one of the ways to, to set the tensioning of that um, MPFL ligament. So there in words is what I've just said, is you, you max, your assistant proximalizers, you can use a bone hook or just their fingers, depending on whether you trust that assistant or not. Um, and then you've got to check out your patella and make sure it's not over constrained. And uh, screw, interference screw, and then again, check it. So the patella in extension shouldn't be too tight. You don't want it over constrained. And if it can, is you just back out your screw and you can loosen it again and reset it. And then just to touch on the rehab, this is a difficult one, but I've again gone with something that Spike said years ago is that I restrict the last 30 degrees of extension initially with a brace. Because remember the patella then has engaged your trochlea, so it's got a secondary stabilizer. It's got a bony, and it's got the bony anatomy stabilizing that patella, and you're not relying so much on your fresh MPFL, but I allow full flexion. And that's just for the first two weeks, and then I start allowing motion again, and I have them partially weight bearing for two weeks. So I'm not going to carry on any further because I think the, the next part of this talk is, is bony, and, and I think Dave's going to cover that much more accurately than myself. So I'm just going to come back and unshare the screen there. Thanks very much, Richard. Nice videos, and um, it's just also nice to see how you know how you do it. Um, tell me, with your portals, and this is just a very specific question, maybe initially, is just with your portals. What type of portals do you use, and do you check, um, you know, the the tracking of the patella through your portals? Uh, when you when you you know beforehand and also after you did the MPFL reconstruction, do you use just the medial or and lateral portals, or do you use any accessory portals? Um, so, so with anything, I think that's patellofemoral. Um, I will use more distal portals to my standard ones, just because I know I expect to be working underneath that patella. So the further I am away from it, the, the better mm -hmm. access I get. And then I'll often use a superior medial portal if I need to do any work on the patella. Okay. Dave, it's the same for you, hey? Uh, yeah, Mark, I, I just use a superior lateral portal to, uh, to okay. assess tracking. Yeah. Um, I know it's without a quad, um, but I do it at the end to, I'd like, I just like to see my patella track that I'm not, over constraining medially because I know even without quads there if I'm if I'm loading that medial side of the patella into the trochlea then I adjust my, my tension okay and then how do you tighten your patella um, your, your MPFL do you also tighten it in extension or do you use you know different ways to um, to figure out where the position is before you put the screw the interference screw in um, I also look for favorable anisometry as spike terms. So I put the bead pin in, I put it in my graft around the bead pin and I, I test it through a range of motion. Um, yeah, so yeah. I think quite similar. Okay. Um, Johan uh, Leroux, are you still there? Yeah. Okay, I want to ask you a question that's mainly just to highlight the, you know, the, some of the, the difficulties in this procedure is when, you know, what do you feel like is the most um, challenging step in this procedure? Um, well, uh, as uh, Richard very, uh, uh, can I say, adequately explained, uh, I think finding those fascia layers is difficult. It's quite easy to go into the joint. Yeah. Um, Richard, I'm sure that was not your uh, video, but uh, I did see some synovial fluid there next to the patella also. Ah. Um, <laughs> it was someone else's video, I know. Um, so that's difficult. Um, uh, yeah, the, the patella is a bit tricky. I mean, the technique we use, I saw also with Spike, it's, uh, you know, it's a bit cheaper. We basically drill two oblique tunnels through the patella and pass a graft through the one tunnel over the patella and down the other one. You, you save on hardware. Um, we've never had complications. I've never had complications, but it's, um, it's tricky. You know, you're working with a small piece of bone. You don't want to fracture it. And then definitely uh, as everyone's alluded to getting that uh, basically getting shuttles point is very important. 
And, so the, uh, that femoral was, tunnel. Uh, there yeah. was one that we tested, basically the isometry, you know, with a hook, uh, proximalized the patella. We thought it was very good. And then when we uh, checked the tracking afterwards, we could definitely see it was maltracking. We over tightened it. I don't know if you remember that case. Yeah, so, look, I mean, almost every case I, I do is, it, you know, I have to be, you know, adjust. Um, but for me, the main, the, the most challenging um, step is to find the femoral, the femoral uh, drill or the femoral tunnel, because it is actually the most important, um, uh, the, the most important step of the whole procedure, but also the most difficult step is to find the exact point because you can easily over constrain um, the patella in, in flexion. And uh, you, 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 you know, once you draw the tunnel, it's obviously difficult to, um, to go back. And then I always sit there and I always think, oh man, where, where must I know? So I know it's wrong, this tunnel, but where must I put that, you know, must I put it anterior or posterior? What? So it's, it's very nice, you know, to, to uh, what Richard was saying is if it's too tight, always, you know, move more anterior and more distal if it's too tight inflection. So I remember that. Um, okay, well, thanks, Richard. Um, do you guys ever do imbrications or repairs? Richard and Dave. I don't. Okay. Uh, I don't repair. Um, the only time, uh, which I'll get to in the talk, that I'll imbricate is with a trochleoplasty. Okay. So um, Hayden Hobbs loves imbrications and he does it, you know, all inside um, without, you know, much, um, in, without any additional incisions. And he seems to have very good results with it. At least he says he doesn't burn any bridges. He just kind of, um, like, um, you know, uh, tightens the MPFL. And if it does fail, then he just does an, uh, an MPFL reconstruction. But because I also he, don't. Because he's uh, one of my closest friends, I'm not going to comment with him, not yet. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, guys. So let's move, let's move on. Um, Dave, why, um, you've got you know, a nice uh, chunk of time to speak about trochloplasties. Cool. Is that up? Yeah, I, I can see it. Yes. Okay. So just to put a little case, okay, so we've, we've spoken quite a lot about the options that we have available and, you know, so quite a common patient. And so when you get your MRI scan, you know, that's quite encouraging to see that, you know, you know, you don't have sort of marked ALTA and you're feeling quite confident to do your, your MPFL reconstruction. Um, but then you get a, an axial slice that looks like that. And these sort of dome-shaped lateral trochleas are the ones where we need to now st start thinking about something else. And um, so just to sort of give what the key points be, so we've got to th think of something else in severe trochlear dysplasia, and we'll get to what that is. Um, not all trochleoplasties are created equal. So there's numerous types discussed and often they get lumped together in the literature. And the one that's preferred is the Baraita technique and I'll explain what that is. If you do a MPFL as a primary procedure, um, they have a, as an isolated primary procedure, there's a higher failure rate and the trochleoplasty gives a better outcome when it's done as the primary procedure. Okay. So trochleoplasty, uh, trochlear dysplasia, sorry, is common in instability. So in, De, in DeJure's series, when he looked at the contributing factors, 96% had some degree of dysplasia, but very few have severe dysplasia with that dome-shaped lateral trochlea. Just to, uh, I'm going to breeze through this, but it's a lot has been spoken about the patella trochlea mis mismatch and what the trochleoplasty does to that. And um, so there's controversy when the shape of the patella develops in relation to the trochlea. And so there's been some in recent studies done where they've done ultrasounds actually in utero. And they say that the, the shape of the patella probably actually develops with the knees flexed in utero and from the more distal part of the trochlea. 
and not from the dysplastic proximal part of the trochlea if the trochlea is dysplastic. And um, so then Fresentes looked at his group of patients with severe trochlea and he measured numerous markers on the patella. And what he found was actually they had within normal limits the Weiberg angle, but they had a decreased medial facet width. And he thought that was potentially due to abnormal traction from the MPFL because of the abnormal um, trochlea. Um, and then Balkarak in his series, he looked at his ones after he had done a, a barata trochleoplasty and he found that he actually improved the congruence between the patella and the trochlea and specific to the barata technique, you match the shape of the trochlea to the patella uh, rather than creating a mismatch, which some of the other techniques do. Okay, so why, why is the, the severe displays important? It's because it leads to patellofemoral maltracking. So there's two things that are happening. One is that there's a decreased contact area between the, and you can see it here, between, so not this whole area getting loaded between the patella and the trochlea, which increases the forces, and that leads to potential pain and arthritis. And then the second is that there's, the patella doesn't engage like it should as it goes into 30 degrees of flexion. So it doesn't get um, uh, aligned with the distal part of the trochlea. And the, especially with a supratrochlear spur, there's increased laterally directed forces on the patella driving it uh, out to, and predisposing it to dislocate. So we've seen De Jure's classification. Um, it's based on axial CT and lateral x-rays. The problem is it doesn't actually have very good internal intra reliable uh, reliability, uh, observer reliability. And it's not very practical to use in decision making. Um, so what I use, um, it's recently been named. Uh, so it was where I worked in Bristol. So they've uh, in the last few months published it now and it's the Ostrich Bristol classification. And they divided it on axial MRI into four types. Um, so normal, shallow, flat, and a convex. And this last type, the convex or severe type, which is a dome shaped or lateral trochlea is the one that we would consider doing a trochleoplasty for. Um, but most patella instabilities have a shallow or flat um, trochlea. And, and just on that note, I'd like to mention also with MRIs, oh, probably the most important investigation you can do. One, because it gives you BIDARTS index for um, the degree of patella alta. But two, it, uh, CT scans undercall the degree of dysplasia because um, so they did a study where they compared the CTs and the MRIs in the same patients. And there's a large degree of this, the, the dysplasia is actually in the cart shape of the cartilage as well, which doesn't get picked up on the, on the, on the CT scan. And it also shows you if, you're gonna, if you've got any significant chondral wear because that'll be a, a contraindication to doing a trochleoplasty. So you're trying to create an anatomical trochlea that helps the patella to engage uh, as it goes into flexion. You remove the supertrochlear prominence that helps to remove the, those increased lateral directed forces on the patella. And it acts as a pr proximal realignment. So you lateralize the proximal part of the trochlea, which also helps with the patella to engaging into the, the trochlea. So as we've said, it's a severe dysplasia. So that's group four. In a skeletally mature patient, they've got to have failed uh, um, a non-operative management and have recurrent instability. And then the last point is a little bit more controversial, but it's supple cartilage. So you reach a point where if you attempt the trochleoplasty, then the cartilage is too brittle and you're right in the risk of, of cracking it. And um, these are very few patients because normally if, if you've been left with instability and that degree of dysplasia, um, they have too much wear in any case, and you have to consider salvage options. Um, but it's around about the early 30s to sort of mid 30s. After that, it becomes very difficult to do. So we did sum up into the late 30s, but um, it becomes a lot more difficult, well, makes a difficult operation a lot more difficult. So these are the, some of the trochleoplasties, more common ones being described. So the, the, firstly, the, the different techniques is the lateral facet elevation one, deepening, which are the most common, and then the recession trochleoplasty. 
So Albi described the lateral facet elevating. Um, it was back in, I think, 1914. And it, um, he put a, a bone block to elevate the lateral side. But one of the problems with it, it, it doesn't appreciate what the pathology is, which is an increase in bone actually in the middle of the, of the dysplastic trochlea. So by increasing the lateral facet, you just overload the lateral part of the tilla and it, it causes increased pain and eventually arthritis. So it's very seldomly done uh, today. Gautelier in 2002 described the recession wedge technique. Basically what he did was, it's a much simpler procedure, but he took out a wedge of bone from underneath the, the trochlea and simply lowered the height. So it doesn't change the, the sulcus angle. It does to an extent remove the supertrochlear spur, um, but it's not really correcting the underlying abnormality. Then of the deepening techniques, De Jure described has subsequently been modified. His technique where he takes, he creates a thick osteochondral flap, removes the, sub, the bone and deep to that. He cracks it centrally and then fixes, fixes it. It has a few problems um, in the technique. One, you can't adequately um, correct do a proximal realignment with it. Two, you can't go distal enough with it to the notch, which creates a cliffhanger effect. So you get abnormal uh, patella tracking as it comes around the corner into flexion and these are the ones where you you create a patella trochlear mismatch and potentially load your patella on these two points um, here because you're not matching it to the shape of of the patella recently arthroscopic techniques have been described there's limited evidence on them having seen them well watched them done sort of the the, the demonstrations there's a few concerns with it. One, you can't get distal enough. And two, you can't adequately create a groove deep to the cartilage. So you're more lowering the height of the, of the, the, the trochlea rather than creating a central groove and doing the proximal realignment. Um, and again, you're making a difficult operation a lot more difficult. Um, so then it gets to the Baraita technique. And what you do here is um, you have to elevate a thin osteochondral flap all the way to the notch. So what you can see on that move there and use a series, series of osteotomes to do it. You need osteotomes specifically dedicated to the procedure because they need to be sharp. And um, then you, deep to it in the subchondral bone, you create a more anatomical trochlea. Uh, so you move firstly with a burr, the supertrochlear spur, and then with a series of uh, osteotomes and burrs, you create a, a trochlear shape and obviously re testing it as you go deep to it. And you want it to be slightly more lateral proximally. You want it wider, more broader and shallower proximally, going narrower and deeper as it goes centrally. Um, and then fix it with vicral tape and, um, and then research the synovium onto um onto the edge of the of the repair um so looking at the evidence of series of just done baryta trochleoplasties there's a numerous and four trochleoplasties are fairly large numbers and they've got very low redislocation rates i'm going to get into the study by metcalf uh, shortly because uh, that was from the unit where i worked um and what they did was so the largest series and the longest follow-up of all the series is um, uh, they did a baryta trochleoplasty and a medial soft tissue plication and there's a number of reasons why we weren't doing an MPFL reconstruction with it um, they had up to 12 years of follow-up good outcomes um, so the majority of failures came in the first 50 patients and that was because they did no medial uh, soft tissue procedure in those patients and once they added the medial application, the, the failure rate came down to less than 3%. Um, and then, so now if we look at an MPFL, we've heard it's, it's a great operation and it works very well in the majority of patients, so mild to moderate dysplasia. But however, we look at the group with severe dysplasia and isolation, there's a higher redislocation rate. Um, and if you try and overcome those abnormal forces by the very severe lateral forces from the dysplasia, increase the contact pressures and potentially cause patellofemoral overload and arthritis. Two recent meta-analyses that were done um, show, uh, they, they showed that so in severe dysplasia, there's low redislocation rates with a trochleoplasty compared to an MPFL. Equivalent if you do both of them in moderate dysplasia, but you wouldn't want to do a trochleoplasty in that group because it's a much more 
technically difficult procedure. And if they looked at the MPFLs groups, there's a 3% dislocation rate in moderate dysplasia versus 18%. But some of the studies went up to 100% at average at 18 in the severe dysplasias. Um, similar in Balkarax meta-analysis, they found 7% uh, with the MPFL alone versus 2% with the trochleoplasty. Um, so just getting back to it. So in severe dysplasia, you consider a trochleoplasty, consider the barita as the preferred technique, and it should be done as a primary procedure rather than a salvage. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Dave. It's a very well researched talk. Thank you very much. Uh, um, very nice um, images and, and, and very nice to understand it through your, through your view. Um, my question to you is, are you doing these operations in South Africa? And if so, you know, what do you kind of, what do you have available in South Africa to, um, to in terms of instrumentation? Um, so there's very low number of patients that I've seen that are suitable here. Um, I think it's a number of, of factors. So the Unitiles in the UK drained those patients from the whole country. Um, so there we had one a week or two a week. Um, where obviously here they broad a broader term, and I think there's a genetic component to it as well. So Spike always says that uh, he feels that the people with the weak knees didn't get on the on the boats to come to South Africa. Uh, <laughs> So um, we definitely don't see as much. I, I, moment I see maybe one a year that's sort of suitable. I've got my own osteotomes so that um, ready. Yeah, that are so they don't get used for anything else. Um, I bought them and keep them myself. So I, <laughs> I um, do it. I don't think you you can do it otherwise. So I think if you're going to do it as a procedure, you're going to have to you have to have specialized instrumentation. Um, to do it. It, there is a you know a burr with a stopper that you can basically you know that kind of burrs right into a certain depth and then it just keeps it keeps it there is there something that you considered from i think it's an art from arthrex or kind of no um i think you just got to i mean obviously you got to be when you make the groove you've got to be careful well you got to and you've just got to keep retesting um, so there's quite a lot of, of excess bone that you need to remove from centrally. Um, and then, so that with an osteotome to start, and then the, 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 the burrs just shape over that. So you don't actually want to remove a lot of bone with the burrs. It's more just creating the, the pattern and the shape to get it. Um, and you use a series of burrs. So you start with a, th a thicker burr, a, th a larger burr, um, work into a finer burr more distally so you can get around the corner and then sort of do a final sort of smoothing over with a, a larger burr again. Um, and then constantly laying the cartilage back onto that, testing it with the shape of the patella, seeing how it tracks and then, you know, adjusting the, the, the how, how the, uh, the, the, the shape basically. A lot of it is probably art because I mean, how can you, how do you know where to run the midline of the trochlea, you know, whether it's now a little bit too lateral, a little bit too media, whether it's too, you know, is it wide enough proximally? Is it deep enough distally? Yeah, yeah. So I think a hundred percent, I mean, it's sculpting you, you know, there's, yeah. there's, there's very few landmarks and things that you can use. You having to, to rebuild because it's completely, the trochlea when you get in there is completely, is, you know, it's, is not it's anatomical completely just plastic so you have to recreate that shape um, and then another question i had is in in the states it's almost not done this is a very european thing is there a reason for that or you know why why would you why would you think is it mainly just done in, in europe um I'm not sure what the incidence in the states they're, they're seeing of severe dysplasia, but it must be, you know, it must be there. Um, I, I know that the, even the meaning most European centers is only a small number of people doing it. And I don't know if it's also the model of, of healthcare where there's specialized centers, you know, yeah. so if you have a whole bunch, a whole group of people working in isolation, then I, I don't think you're going to get people as many people doing it. I'm not sure if that's the reasoning, um, but in Europe, there certainly is 
you know, especially with these kind of things, referrals to specialized centers. So most, you know, I mean, between De Jure, Jonathan Aldridge, um, you know, there's one guy basically per region doing a significant number. And and I think that makes a significant, makes a difference. It gives you the confidence to do it. Okay, Richard and Johan, have you got any questions?